Robert Palmer, Sarah Long, Ian Forrester, very warm welcome to the Digital Markets Research Hub. We will be talking today about the uh, latest UK initiative in the area of ex ante digital competition law and policy, namely Digital Markets Competition and Consumers Bill, uh, about the latest development with the bill, about the uh, its intellectual theoretical underpinning, its normative underpinning, the, about the implications for 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 the markets and for the the position of of uh, undertakings with strategic market status about the effectiveness of the bill and i, I think we have uh, three remarkable specialists in in the in the area of comp uk competition law and eu competition law so i wanted to use this opportunity just to lend your views and to to have a, an informed conversation on on this topic thank you very much for your availability and i propose we start with just you know kind of intellectual disclaimer maybe uh to if i can ask each of you to, to 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 manifest your normative position do you endorse this this new regulatory initiative or is it something which you are more cautious more skeptical maybe we can start with with you robert yes for sure i i, I do welcome it i think it fills a gap in our current competition and regulatory framework um i don't welcome it in its entirety and wholly and in all respects i think there's a lot more to be worked through than has been worked through to date um, but it has certainly been designed to plug a gap which as you'll know has been long identified this goes back some time it's genesis coming out of the Furman review which reported back as long ago as march 2019 and that first recommended the establishment of a digital markets unit and the CMA did set up a digital markets unit over uh, um, two going on three years ago um, uh, but although that digital market unit has been in operation and has been uh, already studying uh, tech related digital markets related markets it, it has identified action which it would like to take and which is identified with a view to this bill coming forward in due course but which at the moment it's powerless to undertake uh, and so when we come on to talk about the various kinds of conduct requirements which can be imposed the various pro-competition interventions which can be imposed effectively bringing um, remedies uh, forward procedurally making it easier for the cma to impose to, to um, remedies on a, on a given market um, I think there's been a long call for this. I think the CMA has been haunted by some of the what's well, now perceived as failures to intervene at an earlier stage. Um, it feels like it's sort of let the cat out of the bag with Facebook uh, acquiring Instagram and WhatsApp, and we'd like now to be able to rewind the clock a bit and impose at least some behavioural requirements on how these large tech operators do do operate, and that this bill provides that opportunity in a way which just hasn't previously been present uh, and so to that extent I think it's to be welcomed. Thank you Robert. Sarah how do you see this new initiative? Well it's been discussed many times but it's always worth I think taking time to take a step back and reflect on sort of what makes digital markets sort of special or unique and why they're deserving of effectively what's quite special treatment from a competition law perspective. And I sort of think about this as the tassel effect of digital markets, which is really just a mnemonic to help me remember all the important aspects. So we have tipping, we have advantage, speed and spread and lock in effects. So effectively, on the tipping point, people value being on the same online platform as others. That's well established. But then we have these very unique economics of online platforms, which means that although there's usually very high fixed or sunk costs, but then benefit massively from economies of scope. So new products from the same platform benefit from their existing investments, and that means lower incremental costs, and that makes these digital markets prone to tipping. So that's something that we've seen, and that's well documented. Then we have the sort of the advantage of the data gathered by large platforms. So this gives them a powerful advantage over their competitors and any other potential or future competitors in related markets. So then we can sort of see the market power being leveraged from one market to another. And then we have the speed and the spread. So 
The scale, scope and development in digital markets means that the speed at which competition harms arise and then and then they're spread across the economy is unprecedented compared to other markets that we've sort of witnessed in the recent past. And then all of these factors combined result in a lock-in effect. So that's the benefit of those who've managed to entrench their position in a market and then to the detriment of those that are looking to bring new and innovative services to the same market. And the CMA has been very clear in its um, uh, submission and do documented in you know, lo lots of um, many, many conferences that these are well-established issues that are very particular to digital markets. And the issue we had with traditional ex post competition law enforcement is that arguably the entrenchment and the tipping of digital markets could all be done without sort of really violating existing competition laws. And the toolkit that competition authorities had was very backward looking. So tackling issues after they'd occurred. And the CMA has been very open in saying that the existing laws lacked the specificity and they were also targeted at very one off remedies and kind of quite a protracted adversarial process. So all of these sort of factors combined meant that a slightly different approach was required. Will it work? I mean, time will tell. I think the devil really is in the detail. It's a um, it's a UK regime like no other. And we will be kind of unpacking it, partly in this discussion, but also for years to come. And I think it's one of those um, bills where the more you read, the less you understand and the more questions you have. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah. Ian, the, the last word on, on this matter to you, please. Well, I don't think I can give uh, the last word, uh, except just to make a couple of kind of general observations. Uh, in my young day, as a practitioner, uh, competition law was about um, correcting the uh, the infringements of the of the guilty. So, articles eighty five and then uh, one hundred one um, and um, one hundred two. Uh, those were there giving. A framework within which to make competition and uh, it could be approached in a in a classy criminal manner. In other words, there was an accusation and the lawyer's job was to formulate technical explanations as to why the made sense. Um, the allegations were false or the allegations were correct, whichever might be the case, and then to squeeze that into a legal assessment with the previous authority. Now, we've seen over the past, I suppose, uh, a dozen years, 15 years perhaps, that the competition rules, particularly uh, the rules on abuse of own position have been so that uh, they condemned practices which made excellent business sense for those participating, uh, which weren't contrary to previous notions of abuse of own, but which did have a big market impact. And so uh, in cases like Microsoft, where I was on the defending side, we had policies about tying, for example, um, self-preferencing kind of, those policies uh, which were framed as infringements, the quasi criminal Ponder. And here we've gone over the bridge, really, and we no longer require to condemn, to convict. Instead, we say, all those people step forward and know that you're subject to more severe, uh, yeah, more severe, more targeted, more explicit, more intrusive, maybe. Uh, examination. 
Now, uh, whether that's good or bad, one can argue, but really the way that things, so to speak, are going. Uh, when I was um, in court, I realized how, <clears throat> how delicate, how uh, tricky it was to make judicial decisions on such questions. In other words, uh, when the enforcement authority is presented with pile of reports saying electric cars and hybrid cars are in the same market, and another pile of reports saying they're not in the same market, the commission by or the, the authority by deciding one way or the other decides in fact whether someone is in a dominant position or not. Now there's ample authority on both sides, plenty of studies to say either yes or no. And uh, you use the word normative never sure what it means, but uh, you can say that the public authority makes a normative choice when it decides they're in the same market. Uh, they could go either way. They would have good justification for going either way. And the challenge for the judge, the court, is to say that distinction or that conclusion with which uh, I disagree, nonetheless, isn't beyond the discretion of the authority to make that normative choice. Now, here we have a much more um, inclusive, is maybe a word, uh, much more prescriptive, much more inclusive. Um, a regulatory re regime. And the challenge for the court will be how far is the court entitled to substitute its own conclusion, its own impression, its own internal sentiment, sentiment, its own professional uh, opinion for that of the public authority, which is obviously the principal one of the company. So the new legislative regimes in, uh, in Brussels, London, wherever, also the United States, are much more exigent, much more skeptical than their predecessors were. Is that a good thing? I think it's an inevitable thing, uh, given the um, apparently the apparent um, implications of irreversibility of 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 tipping. I'm very intrigued by these developments, but where we're going to end up, I don't know. Thank you very much, Ian. And we will have an opportunity to, to look at uh, different uh, trajectories which this uh, legislative initiative uh, proposes uh, to, 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 the, to, the, to the field. And I propose to, to start unpacking a little bit the bill, assuming that most of our uh, viewers uh, know, know, know more about the DMA than about the DMCC. We will be use, using DMA when, when necessary as a comparator, so to say. And the first element which appears to be um, very influential maybe Robert maybe you can reflect upon you can start reflecting upon this designation it looks that the designation criteria apart from one which which looks quite mysterious to me about forward looking five years assessment uh, are much more pro enforcer it, it makes the job much easier to to designate the the undertaking with strategic market status and but also even if, if you look at the conduct requirements, it looks that the formula introduced uh, in the DMCC is even much more progressive than so well-known 
uh, and the uh, obligations susceptible for being further specified. It, it gives this opportunity to specify, to tailor each obligation on ad hoc basis for the, the, the DMU. Uh, can you reflect upon the, the, the rationale of such um, generous uh, trust to the enforcer uh, from, from, the, from the legislator? Uh, is it the only modality which can function, which can enable a more or less effective um, regulatory oversight and fine tuning of the of the newly emerged uh, system? Yes, for sure. I mean, I think there's two aspects to that question. One is, you know, what um, what are the designation criteria and how do they compare as between the DMA and the DMCC? And then if if uh, a company is designated as having a SMS. Um, how do the conduct requirements, which can be imposed uh, under the DMCC bill, compare with the sorts of approach which is taken under the the DMA? I mean, I'll start with the designation criteria. Um, I mean, in one sense, I agree with you that the criteria under the DMCC are very, very broad. Uh, and that's one of the criticisms that may be made um, uh, of it. But in a funny way, although there's five criteria, I suspect it's all going to come down in in practice uh, once we're within the sort of the zone of uh, an undertaking carrying out a digital activity to the turnover condition. Um, so let's just run through those five criteria just to remind us where we are. The first criteria is that an undertaking is carrying out a digital activity, uh, and that is. Uh, given a very, very broad definition by Clause 3 of the bill, so providing a service using the internet, uh, or the provision of digital content, or indeed any other activity uh, for the purpose of carrying out one of those uh, activities. So that gets you very, very broadly, if you like, into the digital sphere. Then the second criterion, you need a link between the digital activity and the UK. So that's a sort of jurisdiction threshold threshold but again a fairly low one um, if the number of uk users is sufficient or an immediate substantial and foreseeable effect on trade in the uk then that is enough uh, to establish the jurisdiction link so a digital activity in the uk both very broadly taken then you've got the three sort of substantial requirements the first of which you mentioned that's <clears throat> substantial and entrenched market power that's not defined um but we, it is clear that it's to be performed uh as you alluded to on a forward look on the basis of a forward-looking assessment looking ahead over at least five years and taking into account developments that would be expected without uh, a designation uh and that really is crystal ball gazing uh we might come back later on to discuss you know, for example the cma's approach in the recent microsoft activision merger um and the degree of crystal ball gazing which the cma has to uh, indulge in uh in the microsoft case in really projecting the progress of a so far nascent and not very successful market of cloud gaming um but taking the view that, that will become increasingly important over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, similarly, it's got to look ahead. And that that breadth of discretion it has there uh, is bound to, in practice, lower the threshold. Because if the CMA wants to intervene, then it can find a way uh, of deciding that over the forward five, period of five years, there will be substantial entrenched market power, particularly when you are talking only, as we'll come on to, about um, uh, undertakings which pass the turnover threshold. Then you've got the position of strategic significance. There's various gateways to fulfill that. Take, for example, the first gateway. That's that the undertaking has a position of significant size or scale in respect of the digital activity. So when you come to the fifth and potentially decisive criteria, which is the turnover condition, £25 billion pounds global turnover or £1 billion pounds UK turnover and that's not just limited to the digital market activities that's the whole undertaking's turnover um uh then that in practice is going to be defining exactly who we're talking about it is the microsoft's the amazons the metas of this world um and uh once you bear in mind that level of turnover it's it's really not very difficult to see uh the cma concluding pretty easily 
that these uh, sorts of undertakings have substantial and entrenched market power and hold a position of strategic significance. So um, quite a low bar. And in reality, this uh, legislation is directed at those those giants, Apple, Google, etc. So um, once they're in, um, how do the control or con conduct requirements um, apply as compared with perhaps the more well-known uh, position under the DMA? Uh, and the answer to that is quite simply that this is a bespoke regime. Once you're in uh, scope of the DMA, then the various rules which are set out in Articles 5, 6, 7 of the DMA apply. And there's a fair amount of working out has to be done as to how they're going to apply, but they apply. Uh, there's a rather more subtle regime, uh, for better or for worse, under the DMCC, uh, which might give rise to complaints of a lack of legal certainty, but it might be argued that, well, that allows for a more tailored uh, individual approach to be taken to what can in practice, beyond their digital nature, be very different types of market. Um, uh, so you have the ability to impose, the, the CMA has the ability to impose these conduct requirements, which are tailored to the individual undertaking, and more to the point, can be reviewed over time, supplemented, amended, adjusted uh, as those markets develop, uh, as the degree of crystal ball gazing that was in, indulged in at the um, designation phase becomes a bit less like crystal ball gazing um, and greater certainty is arrived at in those markets. And we can see where, what is actually justified uh, and what is not. And that whole process is, again, I think you alluded to as it is the product of quite an open consultative uh, process, a point which the CMA has been very keen to emphasise as the bill has been going through Parliament. Uh, so they say it won't be sort of us acting behind closed doors. It'll be very open. It'll be very accountable. Plenty of room for consultation, plenty of room for engagement. Um, uh, so... Um, quite a, a difference there with the kind of one size fits all application of articles five through to seven of the DMA. Thank you very much, Robert. Sarah, how do you see this uh, designation and uh, conduct tailoring conduct requirements? Maybe maybe you can uh, also reflect upon the we don't have in the DMA this forward look and in order to, to establish entrenched market position, which is kind of the past tense, we don't have to look forward in the DMA. We do have to look forward in the D, D, in the DMCC, and maybe also on contravening benefit exemptions, uh, which which is which appears to be mandatory requirement. So the CMA has to take and must to, uh, accept this contravening benefit exemptions. Do you think it it will be an important element of the new system? Well, um, I'll pick up first of all as well, just on a couple of really interesting points from Robert. I think the, the flexible, just in terms of that distinction as well between the two regimes, because I think there's a couple of really interesting points to pick up on there. So we've sort of talked about the flexible and bespoke and also sort of role of third parties as well, something which I think we'll probably come to later. There is, there's also something just sort of devil in the detail that's really interesting around definition of users, which I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes on if, if if you'll permit me, because I think this is something that I found very interesting looking across the two, because in the DMA, we talk very, well, the, the Article 3 talks very specifically about it being in, it very, for designation that is contingent on the platform service being an important gateway for business users. And Actually, we have a clarification there that that means effectively last financial year, Gatekeeper has at least 45 million monthly active users and then at least 10,000 yearly active business users. Now, in comparison, if we compare to um, uh, the, the bill in the UK, we have UK user, meaning any user or customer in the UK, but with no specific focus on business users. And I think this is quite an interesting and practical, I and mean, I'm a practitioner, so some of these things are what, what sort of jump out to me, quite a practical distinction between the two regimes, because, and in fact, the most obvious high profile example is iMessage, because Apple's claim that despite meeting the DMA thresholds, 
iMessage does not qualify as a gateway for business users. And specifically there, Apple are claiming very publicly, this is all in, you know, in the press, that iMessage is designated and marketed for personal consumer communications. Now, there's a future looking point here, which is, you know, iMessage does have its own, there's, there's a business iMessage, but there's also an extent, extent to which those thresholds may be exceeded further in the future. But what's really interesting to um, unpack a little bit, the distinction between sort of how the DMA criteria can be met versus the, um, the bill in the UK. So Article 31B states that an undertaking should be designated if it's got this important gateway to business user point. But then Article 3.2 states that undertakings will be presumed to satisfy the requirements if they have the 10,000 yearly active business users. So what I think is quite interesting is how the outcome of the European Commission's market investigation into iMessage will be, and actually whether having at least 10,000 active business users does not actually necessarily mean that a service is an important gateway for business users, as the drafting of the DMA suggests. And, and then, of course, the interesting question is whether Apple would be designated as having SMS and respective iMessage in the UK, which, you know, we've discussed is, is something that requires um, you know, a careful assessment, but we'll have the outcome of the EC's market investigation in advance of that process happening in the UK. So it's it's very interesting to sort of look at the two regimes a, a, across different digital activities, which are effectively global in the sense that these are, as, as Robert said, these are the, the thresholds that the UK has got, very specifically a global turnover co um, condition, not just a UK turnover condition. So they are looking to capture really these, these huge gatekeepers. And I think, just picking up on the, the reference to immediate, substantial and foreseeable effect, that's quite interesting because the bill states that the activity must be likely to have that immediate, substantial and foreseeable effect on trade. So it's quite interesting because I think the CMA is giving themselves quite a lot of room to be able to look forward and particularly identify going forward how there could be um, a particular effect in the UK on the UK market that's not necessarily limited to business customers. So there's a real focus on the consumer as well. Interesting. And even in the labels, gatekeepers in, infers some, some logic of in, being intermediary, whereas strategic market status, by definition, doesn't require necessarily being this indispensable kind of layer between mm -hmm. the end users. Uh, so it, it's it's a significant difference, not 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 properly reflected yet, I think, to my limited knowledge. Thank you very much, Sarah. Ian, moving to 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 your views, maybe obviously you 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 have this uh, remarkable uh, um, you know uh, position of of being academic, being a, a, a practicing lawyer, being a, a, a judge, also a, a member of competition appeal tribunal how do you obviously can you reflect upon these issues maybe through the projection of of justiciability of 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 of, of some of these provisions i have a radical mentor suggestion from my previous life as a practice uh, we saw from um 90, the end of the 90s onward, the increasing use of law uh, stretched to catch not obviously infringing conduct, conduct which was adopted because it made business sense rather than because the elephant wanted to crush the small warthog in the jungle. Um, we can see the increasingly creative use of uh, 102 and the rules on abuse of the dominant position. Uh, when Brussels was uh, the, I'm talking, yeah, yeah, in Brussels, was the most interesting destination for creative lawyers with 
novel theory. They had more prospects of success in Brussels than in federal district court in California, because there the case would be tried possibly by a jury and juries surprisingly were much better at more, much more predictable, much more reasonable than I would have expected in addressing more questions. Anyway, uh, entities, complainants, companies that had a problem in the United States and elsewhere would come to Europe because Europe was a more um, tolerant, a more encouraging, a more friendly uh, forum for the making of novel conflict. Two observations. The first is that what we're seeing now is the making of, frankly, an admission that these matters are regulatory to a degree rather than the punishment of quasi-criminal conduct. The setting of uh, generalized rules for huge companies with a huge impact in the marketplace are enormously successful and profitable. Is that bad for consumers? Uh, is that damaging to competitors? Could they be restrained? Now, the new regulatory regime that's emerging in the UK and in Brussels, what in very much in parallel, um, one could defend it, justify it as saying, for the avoidance of doubt, these are the standards which we expect you to adhere to. And you won't in future, you may not in future, maybe, maybe not, um, be accused in the old way of stretching the law beyond what it was before to catch something actively presented by a complainant. That's one statement. And the other statement, which I mentioned a moment uh, when I first spoke, is this development is unfolding on both sides of the Atlantic. Whereas in the um, period of the, the Bush presidencies, uh, American antitrust law was quite um, you might say big business friendly. You might say it used the law in a properly conservative way. You might say it was tolerant to big business, but whatever, however you characterize what went on in the 2000s, uh, what we're seeing now with the two enforcement leaders in, in Washington uh, is the dramatic shifting of the interpretation of the law, the enforcement, the application of the law to something that is arguably, no, not arguably, certainly closer to the kind of uh, intrusive, um, prescriptive uh, model that we've got in, in Europe. I think that's, that's very interesting. Uh, whereas uh, 20 years ago, um, the uh, U.S. or th the the U.S. voice in the international discussion of uh, conflict in our policy was: um, Do you really need to go that far? Careful, careful. Um, we appear to be in a regime where the two sides of the Atlantic are pushing in parallel directions. That's, that's very interesting. I, I'm, I'm speaking totally personally. Um, I think it maybe is more honest, more frank to admit that this is a real field which um, calls for or where regulation um, is a more um, efficient mechanism 
than uh, proving guilt. Thank you very much, Ian. Robert, I wanted to revert now to more technical, uh, after clarifying more kind of doctrinal, more, more, more normative parts uh, to, on the more technical side of the bill. And namely, uh, can you explain to us, it looks that it, uh, the original plan was to have a kind of pro, pro, uh, a code of conduct, which is called uh, conduct requirements in the, in the current version of the bill, uh, followed by pro-competitive pro -competitive, as they were called before now it's pro-competition interventions um, now it looks that we have two parallel regimes that the, the the DMU can opt for both is it correct uh, is it a correct understanding and if yes how can you link the, the second one the PCIs with the current market investigation mechanism what does it try to remedy what does it try to improve What's the logic be, or what's the relationship between these two autonomous regimes? Can you can you explain the mechanics to us, please? Well, I can have a go. Yes, um, there are two um, regimes which are set out in Chapter 3 and Chapter 4, respectively, of Part 1 of this bill. Uh, the first, Chapter 3, is the introduction of conduct requirements that I was talking about earlier. Um, and they really are a, a novelty um, uh, in a way that the chapter four pro competition interventions aren't so much. And I'll, I'll come on to explain why I think that is. But if you start with the conduct requirements, uh, I mean, they're incredibly broad and they are effectively introducing a new regime of uh, ex ante regulation, going back to what Ian was saying uh, earlier, the emphasis is no longer just on catching the offender after the event, it's putting in place, in effect, regulation, <coughs> regulating digital activities in a wholly new way, uh, the CMA hasn't been able to do before that. And the essential power is very, very broad. That's in section 19, it's uh, subsection three, uh, and that is, uh, to uh, the definition of a conduct requirement is requirement as to how the designated undertaking must conduct itself in relation to a relevant digital activity. Uh, and so the power is to impose one or more conduct requirements on a designated undertaking. Uh, now that, that's extraordinarily broad on its face. So what are the limits on that? What, what are the... Um, the constraints on the exercise of that power uh, and the answer to that is well the constraints are pretty broad as well and and broad in the sense of being quite a low bar and not not much of a break on the exercise of that power you've got first of all um the first requirement which is in subsection five of section 19 that the cma may only impose a conduct requirement if it considers that it would be appropriate to do so for the purposes of one or more of the following objectives. And then you've got three permissible objectives. One is fair dealing. The other is called open choices. And the third is trust and transparency. And each of those are then defined. Uh, and fair dealing, for example, again, very broadly, the focus is on users or potential users of the relevant digital activity. And it's to ensure that they are treated fairly and able to interact directly or indirectly with the undertaking on reasonable terms. So very, very broad user-focused purpose there. Uh, open choices, again, focus on users and potential users. It's to ensure that they're able to choose freely and easily between the services or digital contact, content provided by the undertaking. And trust and transparency, again, focus on users that they're able to understand the services or digital content provided, including the terms on which they are provided and make properly informed decisions about whether and how they interact with the undertaking in respect of that relevant digital activity. So again, very, very broad, but focused on improving choices, terms and conditions, fairness, transparency, educating the users to what options are in the, in the market concerned. And uh, the second constraint is just that the conduct requirement must be one of various prescribed permitted types, which are all listed in, in section 20. Uh, but again, 
although the requirements have to fall within one of the permitted types of conduct requirement, those permitted types are drawn very, very broadly indeed. And I won't go through all of them. But for example, uh, they're ones which are um, imposed for the purpose of obliging a designated undertaking to trade on fair and reasonable terms. Um, and uh, uh, equally, they can be uh, prohibitions preventing them from applying discriminatory terms and conditions or, or restricting uh, interoperability, preventing them from imposing, imposing, um, um, uh, 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 preventing an undertaking from restricting uh, interoperability, uh, and so forth, or using data unfairly. Um, so there's an incredible breadth there of entirely new powers, which are behavioral in um, form, quite different from the sorts of structural remedies which the CMA has tended to impose uh, when presented with a uh, actual or prospective merger, where what it's looking at there is a structural change in the market and its preferred remedies are almost invariably a structural remedy to so separate out those companies again and um, uh, ensure that they are competing with each other. The, these sorts of remedies are far more behavioural, setting the terms upon which these vast undertakings uh, actually operate and trade and interact with, with users. Um, when it comes to the pro-competition uh, interventions, which are provided for in uh, Chapter 4 uh, of the Act, you have, uh, or the bill, I should say, you have there what um, is really much closer to uh, the powers already available to the CMA under its market studies, market investigations. Um, the difference really is one of procedure. Um, so under the PCI regime, the CMA can impose a pro-competition order, which must follow a PCI investigation. Uh, and that investigation must be into whether a factual combinations of factors relating to a digital activity is having an adverse effect on competition. So using language which we are already familiar with in the context of market investigations. Uh, and secondly, making uh, a PCI would be likely to contribute or otherwise be of use for the purpose of remedying, mitigating or preventing the adverse effect on competition. Uh, and in doing that, they must balance any adverse effect against benefits to consumers. And then the resulting order, if one is made, can impose requirements again on the undertaking as to how it must conduct itself. But there are overlaps between what it can then impose there and what can already be done under the market investigation references, because pro-competition orders can include the same provisions that can already be included in enforcement under, under section 161 of the uh, Enterprise Act. Um, I think the big difference is that the bill envisages that the process of making a pro-competition order can be made whenever it identifies a competition problem and believes that the pro-competition order would be useful to remedy or mitigate that problem. So it's a streamlined process, still including public contribution, but uh, consultation, but can include, for example, innovations such as uh, requirements imposed on a trial basis to see if they would in fact uh, be uh, effective. Um, and um, so that is uh, really the main main difference between what we have already and, and what 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 is coming under this regime. So they are two different but complementary sets of uh, powers. Uh, each with their own innovations, but um, certainly PCIs uh, are more of a sort of souped up, streamlined, more flexible process for the sorts of things which can already be done by virtue of market investigations, where, whereas the Chapter 3 conduct um, requirements are really, a, a, it's a whole new toolkit that the CMA is being given. Thank, thank you very much, Robert. It's, it's, it, 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 
it raises many interesting issues for, for further uh, observation, uh, how they will be implemented. I wanted to revert now to Sarah and maybe ask you if you want to, to elaborate on some matters which have been mentioned earlier by, by Robert and Ian. But also, uh, when we follow the discussion in, 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 the, in, the, in the different committees um, in, in the parliament, we hear that the, the reference to the participatory model is being at the core of of uh, the uh, of the new regime so there must be some we we bestow upon the enforcer significant discretionary powers uh, in in order to somehow mitigate the existing disbalance now after you hold this uh, discretionary power you you can enter into the room and engage in a proper meaningful a participatory conversation where you will be heard, your arguments will be heard because they are empowered with strong uh, competences, so to say, metaphorically speaking. So, do you think this uh, this is a, a helpful a helpful modality? And maybe a, a, on the side question, which has been raised several times during the parliamentary discussions. Granting such discretionary power to, to public enforcer is one thing, but we also leave the room for private enforcement. Is it would it somehow undermine the this delicate balance of, of trust, which is inevitable in order to this participatory model? Or do is it a potential, is it just keep it even more um, you know, it in encouraging to to part to to commit to so to comply? There's, there's a lot to unpack there, Alice. I think one thing that we do know is that there is quite some room for interpretation of the bill. And I think that what we also know is that the CMA is, is currently drafting guidelines in order to really help everyone understand how they intend to do certain things. And they've confirmed that they are working to the same time frame as the final statutory instrument for publication. So I think we would expect to see, you know, the CMA has clearly got a huge amount of additional powers and they have made clear that they do, as you said, want this to be a participatory regime, but we need to understand how that works in practice. And, and I would expect to see relatively detailed guidelines from the CMA, DMU, building on the considerable experience that they've gained in the various cases and market studies they've already carried out in digital markets. So that's something we can expect to see, and that should help us understand to a certain extent where and how they expect to apply these powers in a sort of practical sense, because as Robert said, there's a lot of room for interpretation there. And then just picking up on one area where I sort of felt the guidance would be particularly welcome, and that does relate to the CMA's power to make the um, pro-competitive interventions, because um, under 46, they have this power, as I've said, to begin a PCR investigation into a designated undertaking where um, factors have an adverse effect on competition. Now, although this is something sort of we're familiar with in the context of market studies and market investigations, one of the immediate questions for me related to this power was exactly how that PCR investigation is, is triggered. And importantly, can it be triggered by, for example, a third party complainant? So while the CMA has got the power to intervene, one of the issues, and this goes back to the participatory kind of point, is that they're not always going to have the requisite knowledge as to what business practices are going on in the market. I mean, I think for any of us working in digital markets, what we really understand is that you can be advising a client who has some incredibly complex and new business model that they're bringing to market and even those within the market or in the kind of sub market of which they're operating don't really understand how it works because some of this some of these offerings are so technical and the dmu has got a huge number of people who are very well versed in digital markets but there's definitely a sense of wanting to understand from the industry how certain practices work how they affect 
market and that's where this sort of engagement point comes in which we see far more in the bill than we do with dma now the bill is actually silent on the exact point of sort of for example third parties but the explanatory notes which we all refer to helpfully state the following the CMA will form its initial view of the competition problem on the basis of available evidence, so they will obviously have available evidence from the cases they've worked on, such as that arising from complaints submitted by third parties from the CMA's own market studies or from referrals of information from other regulators. So what's really helpful, and this is what I mean about Devon in the detail, if you start thinking about particular questions and go to the bill, you probably won't find the answer. From a practitioner perspective so then you need to go to the explanatory notes you may find some answers there so we can then go okay so the cma is clearly interested in hearing from complaints by third parties before they begin a pci investigation but what we would need to see in any guidelines from the cma is a bit more color of the how the when and the what for parties of mis um, interested in submitting complaints. So for example, will the CMA or the DMU set up a formal process? Will it be a case of submitting a sort of short briefing note to, ste to steal a kind of practice for mergers, identifying key concerns with the behavior of an SMS firm? Those are the sorts of things that we will need to see from the CMAs. So if they want participation, we need to understand how that's going to work in practice. And then I think it's just interesting to note in comparison, so for third parties looking to bring a complaint linked to the DMA, there is no real sort of specific complaints procedure. There's obviously an allowance for third party involvement at various stages, but it's very much third parties may provide comments at, at, before the commission adopting any specified measures. Third parties may be consulted. The commission may consult third parties, but there's no real real clarity as to who to contact, how any of this will work in practice. There's a joint team, obviously, in DG Competition and DG Connect, responsible for the implementation and enforcement of the DMA, but there's some real uncertainty as to what role third parties have in practice. And of course, this has triggered an open letter from various third parties to um, well, both DGCom and DG Connect sort of saying we need clarity on the role of third parties in the implementation and enforcement of the DMA. And we do know that there had been concerns raised in DMA discussions of how allowing third parties the ability to contribute evidence could result in slower procedure. And I can understand why those concerns were raised, but there's a clear sense that failure to allow for third party views would be a hugely missed opportunity to hold gatekeepers to account, particularly in these markets where, frankly, you need to be in the weeds the technical weeds to really understand what's going on. And this is something the CMA really does to appear to appear to acknowledge in, in the call for the powers that they have um, got under the bill. Thank you very much, Sarah. There are obviously an immediate answer would be that they, they have a catalog of public consultations on each step, uh, which would be an opportunity to, to comment. But that's, I, I imagine it's by far not sufficient uh, scope of recognition of the importance of, of third parties with legitimate interests, of course. Let me revert now, Ian, to you. Um, you mentioned elephant earlier, and the real elephant uh, in, in, in this discussion was the level the, 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 of, of judicial scrutiny. Mm -hmm. And we hear, uh, we often hear these two completely different levels of, 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 in, of, of judicial analysis. Uh, and here I refer to, to, to specific parlance used in, in the UK, GR, JR, Judicial Review, uh, and uh, Full Merits Review. Yeah. Can you please explain to us the, the, the difference between, between the two and how do you, do you anticipate your crystal ball would uh, uh, suggest uh, the, the, the DMCC Act will be enforced in court? My, my crystal ball is... Um rather untransparent and uh, grey and murky and misty, uh, like the Scottish weather. But um, uh, yes, OK, let me just add, let me preface my comments with two remarks uh, about what Sarah and Robert have been saying. One is uh, the old regime and the current regime for enforcing uh, by accusation and condemnation, uh, and then appeals. That involved huge delays, uh, sometimes 10 years, 
uh, in the Microsoft case, I was in it, so I remember the the dates. Uh, the first complaint was made, I think, in 99. The decision was made uh, of the commission five years later, and the appeals ran out of steam only in 2010. So uh, we all know that events in the business marketplace in high tech occur rapidly, rapidly, rapidly. And um, the new regime, I would hope, is going to deliver decisions, instructions, and challenge in a much swifter manner, because it won't be necessary for the public authority to say that this conduct, which we think is inhibiting consumer welfare, whatever, um, it's caught by the regulations which uh, are already in force, we must do something. Uh, I guess that delay will be much less under the new regime than it should be. Um, and, I, and I think maybe it will be somewhat more, um, you might say, honest, more frank, uh, because of the, um, the existence of what should I say, instead of stretching the law, uh, the rules are there already. Now, what's the judicial review uh, situation? Um, as you say, there are two approaches, there have been two approaches, and both of them are provided in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Uh, one is what the drafters of the treaty envisaged for an administrative agency that would be that was to be newly created and which would work within a kind of French regime um, where uh, judicial excess um, administrative excess could be uh, trimmed judicially um, but it wasn't for the uh, rewriting of the of the decision by the judicial branch, and there was another one that said uh, where um, penalties are imposed, uh, it will be full judicial review. Now, during all the years of the Court of Justice and the General Court, you can see both um, tendencies in the Luxembourg jurisprudence. You can see uh, the court saying. This fell within the uh, competence of the public authority, um, and there wasn't a breach of the applicable regulations. Okay? Um, and the other one saying, um, I think that went too far. Um, and so uh, you can observe um, a big range. Now, I would imagine that a judge would give more weight to the discretion of the enforcer when it's a regulation, a technical regulation, which requires skillful interpretation, as opposed to um, a regime that involves an accusation, a finding of infringement, punishment um, and a degree of moral obloquy. So on the other hand, uh, and this is why I say that my crystal ball is not clear, on the other hand, uh, we are giving to regulatory agencies huge powers, bigger than ever before, and hugely important topics. And one must assume, as a as practitioner, that the public authority won't be given an easy ride uh, judicially. So I can, uh, again, maybe it's going to be the main advantage will be in speed and you might say immediacy. But um, in two years' time, we'll know much, much better. 
if we look at how competition law has been interpreted uh, in the course of my professional career, we can see a huge evolution. The, the, uh, the ship has turned not 180 degrees, but certainly 90 degrees um, in terms of um, the kinds of conduct that we thought. Uh, th 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 thank you very much uh, for this, Ian. Uh, Robert, judicial review is really a core question. Can you try at least maybe to illustrate to us where would you see, if it's full, uh, uh, and, and compare maybe, what would be the difference? How many sections, how many elements of the new regime would be would, would, would be litigated and how often, if it's a full merits review, in contrast to the judicial review standard? Um, I mean, it's difficult to predict how many challenges you'd get under one standard of review versus another. But what is clear is that the CMA's concern, as it was um, as it's explained during the committee stage of uh, the bill in the House of Commons and, and various other occasions as well, is that they are very concerned to restrict um, all but a very small set of uh, penalty-related decisions to judicial review only and not a merits review. They feel that the consequence of having a merits review is, uh, as Ian was saying, really to delay matters, to cause matters to be hugely protracted in their progress and to mean that parties will be less cooperative with them on, during the administrative stage of any decision-making process because they'll be holding back all their fire for a merits review where the tribunal will embark on uh, remaking the original uh, decision, whereas under a judicial review, uh, they say we'll get far more engaged stakeholders, engaged participants during the administrative phase, knowing that the challenge, that the real merits will be considered at that stage, and that the judicial review beyond uh, a review of irrationality, uh, proportionality, um, will not displace uh, the regulator's view as to the merits uh, of the issue which is being determined. Um, and I think there's only some truth in that analysis. Uh, I think it rather overstates the degree of latitude that the tribunal has on a merits review, which is not to remake the decision ab initio, which is not to start from a blank piece of paper but is to examine whether there is something in the decision which can be said to be wrong but the starting point is the decision not not the problem not the original motivating reason for action being taken in the first place and analysis of that um, and in judicial review they say that well that provides a full and rigorous check on the exercise of their powers and the lawfulness of it again i think that's overstated um, I think the tribunal has been increasingly conservative uh, over recent years as to how it will apply a judicial review standard. I think we can trace that back to a decision of Mr Justice Sales, as he then was in the BAA uh, uh, case, setting out a set of fairly restrictive standards for judicial review, which have since been applied quite narrowly um, just this year, um, a couple of merger-related judicial reviews, one of which I acted for the CMA on, which was Seralia, um, about ready-to-bake dough and a merger decision there. But there, the tribunal really focusing on how narrow the judicial review standard actually is um, and uh, affording the CMA a very wide degree of latitude in the sorts of judgments that it was making, particularly judgments which are made on a forward-looking basis, as is inevitable to a certain extent in any merger review. Um, so uh, to the extent that uh, undertakings anticipate uh, that the tribunal will continue to take this narrow view of judicial review and quite a deferential view to the 
judgment of the regulator in particularly in circumstances whereas ian said was saying that there's huge amounts of regulatory discretion being exercised uh here or to be exercised in this sort of context that may well deter um uh, some challenges as people uh, apprehend that unless there's a particularly clear case um they're unlikely to get anywhere more optimistically perhaps um although the microsoft activision JR didn't proceed to a hearing because of this sort of reconstituted um, uh, merger arrangements, sort of merger 2.0 that Microsoft volunteered. Um, again, there, there was quite a root and branch judicial review attack being brought of the original decision by the CMA. And on this one, again, I was involved but on the on the other side of the fence, acting for Microsoft, so it's hard to to read what the CMA's thinking was. But certainly, one plausible reading of that chain of events was that the CMA's very unusual willingness, effectively, to reopen what's amounted to a remedy question at that stage of proceedings was because, in to an unknown extent, but plausibly to a significant extent they were very worried about how their original decision was going to survive on judicial review in front of the tribunal. So we have to speculate, can only speculate as to what their internal thinking was, but we can note that that reconsideration, acceptance of a sort of recalibrated JR with a effectively a divestment solution being adopted in respect of those cloud gaming rights that I mentioned earlier, may well be because they anticipated some weakness and therefore were open uh, to that recalibrated exercise being pursued, so it, it's not a it's not completely toothless. It can generate significant degrees of concern, uh, but undoubtedly, I think there'd be more appetite for appeals if it were to have been a full merits review rather than as we've got in, in almost all cases uh, this narrower judicial review standard to be applied. Thank you very much, Robert, for this. Sarah, what, what are your views on, on, on this really existential, uh, <clears throat> one of the few ex most existential matters of, of, of the new regime? So there's obviously a, quite a lot of commentary out there weighing up the pros and cons of a, a JR versus a merits um, approach. I think, and looking at this sort of purely from an understanding of how quickly these markets move, I think a lot of the arguments that have been made around the need, the need for speed, meaning that, and the CMA has been very forthright in saying, we, we need to have the ability to move quickly, to deliver results and to intervene. And if there is this risk, which, which you know, Robert has clearly said, of there being an entire unpicking of the case, and a full merits review, that is something that is just not going to work, frankly. And what's quite interesting is that you know, we, under CA98, we obviously, the, the, the merits approach is there, but that is for you know, a backward looking approach in that it's sort of behavior which has happened. But if you look at some of the stats, and these are available, if you look at the stats of um, these cases, and, and obviously there's something Ian's talked about, how long these processes take if you compare a JR versus a merits review, it is sort of months. I think I didn't have them to hand, but I think you can look at JR and sort of say it might be done within sort of six or seven months. Whereas when you're looking at full merits review, that can run to years. And while obviously some people would argue, well, that's great for lawyers. Actually, it's really not because uh, as good practitioners, what we're actually looking to do is find the best outcome for our clients. And the idea that any lawyer would say, I think the best outcome is dragging you through a four year merits review process with the cat. That is something that is not particularly attractive as it happens. So I think from a practitioner perspective, um, I can really see why the CMA has been so forthright in saying this is the appropriate standard. Many practitioners have come out and said this is the appropriate standard. Um, I think the concern is that in the brave new world of the CMA having really quite extensive powers which are untested, others are saying 
this is something that needs to be restricted in some way. Now, I think this is a delicate balance of different interests and the CMA and many commentators have said, look, ultimately we need to go this way because of the unique characteristics coming back to what we talked about at the beginning of the session of these markets. They are unique and they need to be treated, you know, in a particular way. And that may be where we get to the solution that that that, that we may end up with, which is JR only because of the fact that these particular markets need to be approached in a different way. Thank you for this, Sarah. Ian, could, could I would just add uh, two thoughts. One is that uh, if you over uh judicial scrutiny, uh, you, I won't say paralyze, but you, you add to the possibility of delay. There, India is the best example that I know. Um, and the, the, the second thought that in the judgment of the uh, Human Rights Court, Menorini, the uh, court said that in order to satisfy the requirements of Article 6 of the Convention on Fair Trial, and a huge number of cases on the word of that article of the Convention, uh, one should be entitled to, one should receive a review of fact and law in principle. That's the uh, most authoritative recent statement a dozen years ago uh, from the Human Rights Court. Now, how do we reconcile not going so far as to have the inclusiveness of judicial review? Indian style, but satisfying the Menorini requirement of um, uh, a review in principle of the facts and the law. And uh, I just that's a review as the answer. And we obviously see that uh, when two very ambitious regimes uh, have been designed pretty much simultaneously by two sister jurisdictions. Uh, we see many similarities and many differences. Do you think it's too early to think about um, which one will be more effective in terms of delivering the, the, the expected outcomes? Well, uh, I would guess that people who are interested in would not see merit divergence. They would rather see merit in parallel outcome of the same problem. Now, that's a politically sensitive topic these days, but until the Brexit monster has gone back to sleep, uh, it will be, I guess, an important and open question as to how closely the Brussels and London jurisdictions will try to uh, cooperate or, yeah, cooperate is, is one. Um, and I would expect that convergence uh, will be more common than divergence. Thank you for this, Ian. Um, also, maybe the last question before reverting to our recommendations to students. Um, we don't encounter in the part one of the of the bill very often the reference to consumers. On the other hand, we know how ambivalent, how uh, amorphous the term itself is in competition law um, discussions. Uh, it yet still consumer sense of strict or is an important parameter of, of measuring the, the, the performance of, of the new regime. Do, do we have any you know, recommendations or reflections upon the, the role of consumers in, in, in this new architecture of, of regulating competition in digital markets? So I, I do think the explicit focus on consumers in the bill is really not to be underestimated. And just to remind people, 
The sections on enforcement of consumer protection law and consumer rights and disputes run from clauses 139 to 301, so that is practically half of the bill. Now, understandably, the focus has been very much on gatekeepers, platforms, and the lead up to this bill. But competition policy is, after all, focused on the concept of consumer welfare, and it's something that the CMA is very explicit about, and consumer protection is absolutely a core focus of this bill. I think the fact that the CMA will have direct administrative enforcement powers to bring consumer cases, rather than having to take a business to court, which is currently the case, is very significant. And consistent with sort of that objective, the CMA has got wide ranging powers to launch enforcement investigations for, for suspected breaches of uh, consumer protection law and impose you know, big penalties. Now, I think you can pick through various different aspects. There are new provisions governing specific commercial practices like saving schemes, inertia selling. These are all things that as consumers ourselves will be familiar with. But I think in terms of sort of from a practitioner perspective, but also just more widely, and the CMA has been very explicit on this, there is an expectation <laughs> that competition practitioners will understand how to do consumer law. And I think there is an expectation as well that we would be advising our clients, the, those clients who um, previously may, or companies that may have taken a risk-based assessment to how they deal with consumer issues, really don't have the choice to do that anymore. And, and if they are facing what will be akin to a competition law investigation for breaching consumer law, that is something that will need to be taken very seriously. And that is something which the CMA is very explicit about. They are probably, of the competition authorities, the most vocal about consumer rights, consumer issues in terms of really ensuring that marketing campaigns follow on from any action they've taken. And sort of, you know, in terms of crystal ball gazing, that would be one of the areas that I think will be most significant in terms of the change that we see, because it's something that hitherto the CMA has not had the power to enforce administratively. Thank you very much for this, Sarah. I think it's really remarkable to see how, when this all initiative started, we were talking about DMA, DSA, as if uh, almost like synonyms. Now we the, the kind of people specialize on one aspect of, of the regime only. In the UK, we went even further. We have specialists on part one of the of, of the new act. And I, I hear that the, 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 the depth of the discussions in other parts of the bill are equally, if not even more intense, and the stakes, and the stakes are equally important. So thank you for elucidating uh, on, on other aspects, uh, not less important aspects of the bill. The last question which I, I have to you, um, and again, let, us, let, let me start with Robert. We know many, many students, many graduates are uh, embarking in, in, on this new journey. They have many competitive advantages. They are much more technologically uh, mature and, you know, uh, native speakers. Uh, they, they understand the mechanics of the process better. But uh, maybe you can steer and channel them into how to, to, to train their uh, juristic muscles in this newly emerging um, digital digital uh, competition law and policy landscape. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what uh, advice I could give to any student uh, studying this now, but um, if I was to give one piece of advice, it would be this, which is not just to read the judgments which may be handed down by the Competition Appeal Tribunal or the General Court or uh, any other uh, court on appeal, uh, but to turn to and read the original decisions which are under appeal, the CMA's decisions, uh, the European Commission's decisions, and to give those as much attention as what the courts have to say about them, uh, to really understand the way in which these concepts, which we might be uh, familiar with from the textbooks uh, and familiar with from the legislation, are actually applied in the real world at first instance by the regulators themselves uh, because that gives you uh, a lot of insight and feeling uh, as to what the practical bounds of these provisions uh, actually are so that would be my one piece of advice thank you very much robert sarah what what would be your uh, collegial friendly recommendation to to the newer generation 
Well, of course, I would say watch all previous sessions in the Digital Markets Hub. Um, actually, on a more serious note, I remember being a student of Richard Wish at King's back in 2002, and he would appear in class with reams of paper to share the latest amendments of the Enterprise Act. And, and actually, my preparation for that class would often be, in addition to reading those pages, a detailed review of the Financial Times, which I found pretty amazing, given that I had to blow the dust off most of the books for the other areas that I studied. So I think you, the luxury of competition law is not only that it's fascinatingly interesting, combines law and economics, but it is so relevant to everything we do, we see, we consume, we watch. And this is even more true of digital competition law. So my advice is, in addition to everything that Robert has said, I think actually staying interested, reading everything you can across a variety of medium, asking questions and challenging presumptions. Because I think for all of us, we are having to challenge the presumptions of the last 15 years of our practice, 15, 16, 17, longer years of our practice. Because for me, this really is the brave new world for competition law. Thank you very much, Sarah. Ian. Uh, you you you've been kind enough to 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 deliver a guest lecture on one classes a few years ago, and I asked you for a recommendation, and you 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 said some first order things about being inherently moral person, and then all the benefits of the world will somehow automatically will be this magnetic power will come into you. We take it for granted. I have an additional piece of advice uh, to add to what Peter and Robert have. Um, if you're a student, you're looking for a job, and lots of other people are looking for a job. So try to get yourself published. And that means writing 700 words, 1,200 words. Don't be too ambitious. Don't, uh, don't be too excited. Uh, and don't be too broad. Focus on uh, a couple of phrases. Explain it in simple terms. Address yourself to an intelligent 19-year-old. Address it to your favorite aunt. Simple stuff. What is the problem? And then present the two possible outcomes and then suggest tentatively your own and do that in three or four pages and find yourself a publisher there's lots of them around and if you can't do that do it as a blog and there you're distinguishing yourself by your capacity to explain stuff simply and advocacy depends on simple explanation and elimination of that which is surplus. Thank you very much for this. Robert Palmer, Sarah Long, Ian Forrester, thank you very much indeed for spending this 80 minutes with us and for explaining to us the, the legal and normative mechanics of the new regulatory regime, emerging regulatory regime in the UK. Thank you.